Today we have seen a lot of dissection in the morning, those who were there. And we saw a lot of anatomy of these cisterns, subarachnoid cisterns, while doing the skull base approaches. And it is very essential to know this anatomy because it is essential for all skull base approaches, especially also for trauma, as I says in his cistern ostomy. So basically, the brain is covered by pia matter, above which is the arachnoid, and then the complete thing is surrounded by dura. So the subarachnoid space lies between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. And it is run by a multitude of trabeculae. And that's why it has its name, arachnoid. Arachnoidia, which means a spider, like a spider web. So that's why the name arachnoid. And basically, all the cisterns of the brain, they follow the fissures of the brain. And ultimately, all the basal cisterns open into some area of the lateral or the interhemispheric or the transverse fissure. So this is the main lateral fissure of the brain which incorporates the sylvian cistern. And a lot of basal cisterns confluence in this area to join the sylvian cistern. Then you have the interhemispheric fissure, along which you have the callosal cisterns, pericallosal cisterns, and the lamina terminalis cistern in this region. And of course, on the medial side, you have another fissure, that is the transverse fissure of Bicart. And this fissure actually extends from the anterior perforated substance all the way back to the quadrigeminal area. And it is covered medially by the parahippocampus, superiorly by the pulvinar of the thalamus. And it has two limbs. It has a lateral limb and a medial limb. So basically, it is a horseshoe shaped, which on the lateral aspect of the hemisphere appears as the choroidal fissure. And on the skull, on the medial aspect of the hemisphere, it forms the transverse fissure of Bicat, which has all the other basal cisterns. So these are the boundaries of the transverse fissure. As you can see, they are completely similar to the boundaries of the choroidal fissure. So medially, they are bounded by the, laterally, they're bounded by the parahippocampus, the dentate gyrus, superiorly and anteriorly by the pulvinar of the thalamus. Then the median lip has the velum interpositum here. And anteriorly, you have the optic tract and about below that, the anterior perforated substance. So as you see the cisterns in the transverse fissure, they all open into the choroidal fissure ultimately. And if you enter the choroidal fissure from the body of the ventr uh, lateral ventricle, you will enter the cistern of the velum interpositum that is formed by the median limb of the transverse fissure. If you enter from the temporal horn, you will enter the ambient cistern. And if you enter from the uh, atrium, you will enter the quadrigeminal cistern. So this is just an overview of the cisterns that follow the fissures. Now we look at them one by one. So this is an inter a cadaveric dissection showing the frontal and the temporal lobes with the sylvian fissure in between. So the contents, the sylvian fissure is divided into two parts. You have a anterior part or the sphenoidal part and a posterior or the lateral part which opens on the cerebral hemisphere. So once you separate the sylvian veins, you can enter into the proximal part of the sylvian fissure. So the sylvian fissure is divided by a series of membranes. You have a lateral membrane, a medial membrane, and an intermediate membrane. And these membranes separate the constituents of the sylvian fissure. So most superficially, you have the superficial veins, which lie close to the cerebral surface. Beneath that, you will have the M2 and the M3 branches of the middle cerebral artery, which are constituents of the middle part of the sylvian cistern. And proximally, in the sphenoidal part of the Sylvian cistern, you have the middle cerebral artery as it turns in the region of the M1, uh, region of the Lyman insulae, as it turns from M1 to become the M2 in this region. So this is your proximal Sylvian cistern. Now you can see here very clearly that this is your carotid cistern, and the carotid cistern ultimately opens into the Sylvian cistern. They are all bound, bounded by a series of membranes that may be present in some, that may be absent in some. If they are dehiscent, then the confluence is very apparent. And if they are present, you have to cut them while you are performing surgery. So this image has been given to me by my very good friend, Subdeep. And you can see this cadaveric dissection showing these various arachnoid membranes and trabeculations. Here you can see the lamina terminalis membrane, which forms the boundary of the lamina terminalis cistern. 
You have the optic nerves and the optic chiasm. This is the chiasmatic cistern. This is the carotid cistern. Here in the depth, you can see the liliquous membrane, which has again two parts, which I will discuss. So this is the mesencephalic part of the liliquous membrane. When you retract the optic nerves and the chiasm medially, you can see this membrane here, which is the diencephalic part of the liliquous membrane. And this is your region of your carotid cistern and it goes laterally and joins the sylvian cistern. Once you open the liliquish membrane, you can see inside the basilar artery, and you can see how these all these cisterns are interconnected to each other. This is the third nerve here. This is the carotid artery, and here you can see the basilar with its bifurcation. Looking at it, so to explain the liliquish membrane, I have used this image. Here you can see the dorsum cellae. So the origin of the liliquish membrane is from this dorsum cellae. There is one layer that travels superiorly and attaches to the mammillary, in the region of the mammillary body, either pre-mammillary or retromammillary. And this forms the diencephalic membrane. And there is a posterior limb, which goes in this direction and borders the interpeduncular and the prepontine cistern. So it forms a boundary between the interpeduncular and the prepontine cistern. And this is the area of your reliquish membrane, which has two components. So here you can see the basal view of the brain and you can see the various cisterns in this region and its constituents. So the first one that we see here is the carotid cistern bounded medially by the optic nerves and the chiasm. Laterally, you can see that it joins the sylvian cistern. You can see the constituents of the carotid cistern, uh, carotid cistern here are the car internal carotid artery it bifurcates in this region, which I will show you in the next image. Also, you can see the origins of the posterior communicating artery and the origin of the anterior choroidal artery. All of this lie in the carotid cistern. So here you have a cadaveric view showing the uh, proximal part of the carotid cistern in this region. And here you can see how it bifurcates into the anterior cerebral and the middle cerebral artery. Here you have the optic nerves and the chiasm and this is your oculomotor nerve. This is your carotid cistern. This is an intraoperative view showing the carotid artery in the carotid cistern. This is a patient with a ruptured ACOM artery aneurysm and you can see the tense angry brain and how much of the cisterns you have to open to reach the base of the brain. So this is another image showing the chiasmatic cistern and the lamina terminalis cistern. So medial to your carotid cistern. So here you have your, here is the sylvian cistern here is the carotid cistern. Medial to it, you have the chiasmatic cistern. And superiorly to it, you have there is the lamina terminalis cistern. So the chiasmatic cistern runs between the two optic nerves, as you can see here. And the constituents of the chiasmatic cistern are basically the superior hypophysial artery as it runs to supply the infundibulum and the pituitary gland. Above the chiasmatic cistern, here is the lamina terminalis cistern, where the a1 enters and joins to become the ACOM of, to, with the A1 of the opposite side and then forms the, the A2 arteries which run to form the pericalosal artery. So this is an intraoperative view showing the base of the skull, the optic chiasm, the optic nerves. This is your region of the chiasmatic cistern. This is the region of the lamina terminalis cistern. So this is a view from the front. So you have, this is the optic chiasm. You can see the pituitary stalk that is going down. Here is the carotid cistern. The, in between this is your chiasmatic cistern. And just superior to that is the lamina terminalis cistern. The constituent of the lamina terminalis cistern, as you can see, is the ACOM and the A2 as they run superiorly and go over the superior surface of the corpus callosum to form the pericalosal arteries. Posteriorly here is the interpeduncular cistern. And this region here is the confluence of cisterns. So to look at the lamina terminalis cistern more closely, here you see the A1 of both the sides entering, forming the anterior communicating artery and going up to continue as the pericalosal artery. You have the recurrent artery of Hubner, which also originates in this region and travels laterally to back enter back into the anterior perforated sus substance. So again, this is the sylvian cistern, this is the carotid cistern, this is the chiasmatic cistern, this is your lamina terminalis cistern. 
this is an interoperative view again showing very clearly the trabeculations and the membrane that forms the lamina terminalis cistern and once you open this you can enter into the third ventricle so to con the lamina terminalis cistern continues superiorly and becomes the callosal cistern which constitute which has its as its constituent the pericallosal artery as it runs on the superior surface of the corpus callosum so you see this cistern only mostly when you are doing an interhemispheric approach you can see the craniotomy the brain is being retracted of the fox and here you can see both the pericallosal arteries running over the surface of the corpus callosum and this is the region of your pericallosal cistern the next cistern that comes in picture is the olfactory cistern the olfactory cistern houses the olfactory tract and the olfactory stri and it runs from the posterior orbital gyri to the medial surface of the gyrus rectus and again laterally it joins the cervian cistern inferiorly it will join the carotid cistern medially it joins the lamina terminalis cistern not going posteriorly this is the region of your of the brain stem and this is the interpeduncular cistern so this is the cistern that is bounded by the liliquish membrane so this is the region of the mesencephalic part of your liliquous membrane as i showed in the sagittal image so the diencephalic membrane runs towards the floor of the third ventricle and the mesencephalic membrane separates the uh, prepontine cistern from the interpeduncular cistern and the constituent of the interpeduncular cistern is the mesenteric artery as it comes above from the prepontine cistern to the interpeduncular cistern and then bifurcates into the posterior cerebral arteries also you have the posterior perforated substance in this region and all the perforators of the basilar artery and the proximal part of the posterior cerebral artery enter in this region into the brain stem so this is the constituents of the interpeduncular cistern now going to more basal cisterns in this region you have the crural cistern and the ambient cistern so the crural cistern is bounded here by the anterior part of the uncus and the cerebral peduncle and the ambient cistern is bounded by the parahippocampus and the middle part of the temporal lobe it is bounded by the quadriginal plate posteriorly the medial and the lateral geniculate body and this part of the brain of the midbrain the constituents of the crural cistern are basically the anterior choroidal artery and the posterior communicating artery so the crural cistern also has a membrane an intracru intercrural membrane so in its superior part you have the posterior community communicating artery and it's in the inferior part you have the anterior choroidal artery as you can see here very clearly this is the posterior communicating artery as it's joining the posterior cerebral artery and this is the anterior choroidal artery as it is entering the inferior choroidal point in the temporal horn so again the cervian the carotid the lamina terminalis the chiasmatic the interpeduncular the crural cistern and here in this region is the ambient cistern so this region sometimes has is separated from each other by a series of membranes but quite a few times the membranes are deficient so all these cisterns communicate with each other and they form a confluence of cisterns in this region which communicate with the interpeduncular cistern here you can see a more magnified image where you can see the carotid artery with the its branches of the posterior communicating artery and the anterior choroidal artery here you can see portions of the mesencephalic membrane of the liliquish membrane so mesencephalic part of the liliquish membrane as it separates the interpeduncular cistern from the prepontine cistern you can see the basilar artery and its bifurcation this is an intraoperative view from a subtemporal approach where you can see all the various structures the internal carotid artery the basilar the posterior cerebral arteries the superior cerebral arteries the third nerve and the posterior communicating artery this is another view again from the subtemporal approach showing how the cisterns communicate with each other in this region so this carotid cistern communicating here posteriorly with the interpeduncular cistern the crural and the ambient cisterns communicating in this area and forming a confluence of cisterns here a, a, this is a interoperative view of the ambient cistern you can see the cerebral peduncle in this region the tentorial edge the fourth nerve the third nerve the posterior and the superior cerebellar arteries 
So again, as I said, if the membranes are deficient, this is a view that you can see from an interoperative skull-based approach where there is all the cisterns are communicating with each other. So the chiasmatic cistern, more posteriorly the interpeduncular cistern, the carotid cistern, the cervian cistern, and the ambient and the crudal cistern coming in this region and forming a whole confluence of cisterns. Now we have seen most of the supratentorial cisterns. Now let's go to the posterior fossa cisterns. So this is the main cistern here in the median limb of the transverse fissure and you have the velum interpositum cistern which extends from the foramen of Munro here to the subsplenial space here, to the quadrigeminal plate. And the constituents of this cistern are the medial and po medial posterior choroidal arteries and the internal cerebral veins, along with the two layers of the telia choroida. And posteriorly, as they go, they enter into the quadrigeminal cistern, which is bounded here by the quadrigeminal plate, the subsplenial region, and the constituent of this quadrigeminal cistern is the inter, is the basal vein of, is the, sorry, is the vein of gallon. So this is a posterior view from a supracerebellar avenue that shows the posterior aspect of the quadrigeminal cistern. This is the quadrigeminal plate with the superior and inferior colliculi, the pineal body, and this is the region of the quadrigeminal cistern. So these the other cisterns in this region are, we've already seen the interpeduncular cistern, the prepontine cistern, you have the cerebellomedullary cistern, the cerebellopontine angle cistern, which I can show you in, this is an intraoperative image. Uh, this is a petroclival meningioma that was operated by Professor Goel. And the whole meningioma has been excised and you can see the cerebellomedullary fissure, medullary cistern in this region and the cerebellopontine cistern in this region. And the last cistern that we'll consider are the, is the cistern of magna, which we usually use open when we are operating in the sitting position for a posterior fossa tumor. And this is the intraoperative view showing the opening of the cisterna magna, which makes the brain lax and makes the approach to the tumor relatively simple. Thank you very much. I hope this has covered anatomy of most of the systems and thank you very much. Abida, thank you very much. It was a brilliant talk. Any doubts or any questions? Anybody? Any questions? Don't be afraid just to say hi. <laughs> yes, Ahmed says it's a fantastic lecture. Ahmed, I'm glad you are there. Thank you, Ahmed.